Step three, the missing secret. I was on a teleseminar with a marketing friend of mine. We were telling our listeners how important it was to watch out for self-sabotage in our lives and in their lives. We were pretty impressed with ourselves as we told them that their unconscious beliefs would create their reality. That if they didn't get it clear, then they could manifest failure. Halfway through the call, we introduced our surprise guest for the evening. He was a famous self-help guru from another country. The guru came on and began to dismissing what my partner and I had just covered. The guru came on and began by dismissing what my partner and I had just covered. Can I take this to a new level, he asked. Well, of course, we told him. You're the guru. You don't need to unearth your past or change your unconscious, he began. All you have to do is focus on what you want and stay focused on it in each moment. I totally agreed with him, but also wondered how he expected people to stay in the moment, the greatest spiritual challenge of all time, but I kept quiet and let our guest tout his beliefs. I used to be a therapist and quickly saw that it was a waste of time to go into someone's past, looking for the cause of whatever that they were getting at. And he explained, all you have to do is pay attention to your feelings. If it feels good, go in that direction. If it doesn't feel good, stop. I agreed that with all of what I want to do, our guru guests were saying this, but if I had to wonder if he was only seeing a part of the big picture, I began to feel that he was making the same mistake every other goal-setting, self-help, self-improvement, new age guru type was making, so I had to ask a few questions. What if a person sets a goal, watches their feelings in each moment, and still doesn't get the results that they wanted? Then they have a conflict with their subconscious mind, he answered. They need to back off from their goal and go for something more believable. Then we're back to the needing the unearthed beliefs and get get clear I said well you don't really need to do that just know that you're in just know your intention follow your feelings and adjust in each moment a girlfriend missed the point and from what I can see so have virtually all the current spokesmen spokespeople on how to manifest whatever you want what is the point let me explain the story and I'll explain it with a story watch spot spot was a stray dog I claimed as my own pet when I was in college but he used to run off and tear up the neighbor's garden, run across the street and make drivers slam on their brakes and just make a nuisance, a nuisance of himself. So, I put on a small leash, and when I felt guilty from wondering a friend of mine from a three-foot leash, I bought a longer leash, six feet of freedom, and put it on Spot, and then I walked six feet away and called Spot to me. He ran for three feet. He wouldn't go an inch beyond the length of the old leash, and I had to walk over to Spot, put my arm around him, and walk him out the full six feet of the new leash. From then on, he used all of that leash. I think each of us had our limits from which we placed of our freedom. We need the miracles coach. A miracles coach is to help see us in a reality from which we have no limits. Jonathan Jacobs does that with his clients. But he does it in a way from which you may seem pretty strange to you. Hang out onto your seat. and Hang onto your seat and let me explain. see if I could explain it to you. Touching the sky. The first time I had a session with Jonathan, I didn't know much to expect. I thought the man was a little strange because he couldn't articulate what he did. Because, I, because he couldn't articulate what he did. But... I had been curious as a journalist for many years, so I jumped in and did a session with him. What's your intention for this session, Jonathan asked. Well, what do you mean? You can have anything you want. What do you want to focus on? I thought it over for a moment and then spoke. I want clarity on the book that I'm writing about Bruce Barton. What kind of clarity? I want to know what I'm supposed to do next, I said. Okay, let's go upstairs. Jonathan had me lie down in his massage table and he gently guided me to the breath to breathe in different colors. Breathe in the color red into the top of my head and imagine it going through my body and out onto my feet. And we went through the numerous colors. What other color do you need to breathe in, he asked. I said, gray. He then asked me to breathe in the color. And after several minutes of breathing in deeply and relaxing my massage table, Jonathan put his hand over my heart and said, open this up. Well, I didn't consciously do anything. I felt a rush of electricity and energy shoot through me, almost blinding me. There was a strong white light surging through my body, blasting into my head, somehow illuminating the inside of my skull. Suddenly, I felt the presence of angels, spirits, guides. I don't know how to explain it, but it was real. I felt it, a sense it, and I knew that they were there. And these beings somehow worked on me, altering my beliefs, helping me realize that I had more leash than I thought. I'm not see how. I'm not sure. How long? I was in the altered state. Twenty minutes or an hour? I don't know. When I finally sat up on the table, I noticed that Jonathan had a tear rolling down his cheek. When the energy started to blast through me, he moved aside to let it do it, to let it do it, to let it do its work. But the beauty and the miracle of what was he was seeing touched him. He was crying. As my head cleared and I got my bearings, I realized the new, the next step for my book project was to go to Wisconsin to continue, to continue my research for looking for a private papers of Bruce Barn and Historical Museum I had gotten my intention and that's not all shortly after the first session with Jonathan I began to notice other changes in my outer life the book had been working on had been working on began to take a direction that 
and became the seven lost secrets of success. I found a publisher for it. I found the money for completing my research and I bought a new car. I bought a new house. My income soared. How? Why? I've invited the other side of help. I've invited the other side to help me. And it did. The wise choice. As I write these words, I'm very aware that you may think I've lost my mind. After all, here I am, an adult, an author, fairly well-known speaker, marketing specialist who's advertising business executives about their work, talking about spirits. But I also know that you know what I mean. Even the most atheist amongst has been touched by some miraculous, uncanny, or unexplainable. Although no one has ever awaits the other side of life, we all tend to believe something intelligent is there. Maybe it's worth mentioning in this book that helped me from much I was... What, man, what Can a Man Believe by Bruce Barton, and he explained from which little proof for heaven and earth after earth, from which he explained that there was little proof of heaven after earth, but this was far wiser to believe than not to believe. In other words, while I can't prove the angels and guides are standing and ready to help you, it isn't much more delicious and comforting as a magic, magical thought to believe them to not believe in them. It's, not, it's much more delicious and comforting and magical thought to believe in them than to not believe in them, and there's no concrete evidence to support them or deny them. But when you can use the belief in them to create miracles, wouldn't you be wise to do so? That's a mysterious something. That mysterious something. Yesterday, a friend of mine called and said that she wanted and believed in the guides and angels and teachers from the spiritual side of life, but a part of her doubted they existed. So that's okay, I said. I have my doubts too. You do? Sure, I said. If you have to go into the court and law and prove that you had spirit guides, they would laugh me out of the courthouse. There's no proof of them. But also, there's no proof against them. And then I remembered something that I read in recent issues of Reader's Digest, where Larry Dossie talks about this prayer in his prayer. And he says, praying healthily recovered, helped him recover from an illness. In many cases, they recovered from the doctors from what they say was incurable diseases, from what successful patients was in pray. The patients admitted that they didn't know if the prayers were answered. But it was the belief in the praying and the act of praying that helped them anyway. Again, Barton pointed out, it is wiser to believe than not to believe. Believing helps create miracles. And Barton wrote in the following passages of 1927, What can I, what can a man believe? I've always loved it, as it seemed to stir the very something he talks about within me. See what it does for you. In 1927, Barton wrote, What can a man believe? In every human being, whether emperor or cowboy, prince or pauper, philosopher or slave, there's a mysterious something which he neither understands nor he controls. It may lie dormant for so long as to be as forgotten and as repressed as a man supposed as it is dead. But one night he is alone in the desert under a starry night. One day he stands with bowed head and a damp eyes besides an open grave. And there comes an hour when he clings with desperate instinct to the wet rail of a store storm-tossed boat, and suddenly out in the forgotten depths of his believing, of his being, this mysterious something leaps forth. It overreaches habit. It pushes aside reason. And with a voice that will not be denied, it cries out to its questioning and its prayer. So let me assume that you don't have to cross the healer like Jonathan, though you can reach out other healers and mentors by emailing them in the back of this book. What can you do? Easy. Focus on what you want and make one of your intentions finding someone to help you clear yourself of old beliefs so that you can create a life that you want. Help exists. State your intention to the world and allow it to come to you. I feel it's important to have support from a mentor. It's easy to fall back into the old way of thinking, to feel sorry for ourselves and to play the role of a victim. A vast majority of current friends probably won't even support your desire or create miracles. When I first stated seeing Jonathan, I would visit him once a month. He and I quickly saw they needed to stay in touch at least once a week. Jonathan and I made a pact and said, whenever I am not clear, I am to call him. Then whenever I could let something in life throw me for a tailspin, I would call him. Another woman recently asked me, what if I meant to get clear? What it, what it meant to get clear with my beliefs? Well, I thought about it for a while, and if I could answer it, the imagine came to me as a football team. As one of the players is hurting and upset and feeling neglected and angry because the coach overlooked him earlier and his girlfriend dumped him, that one player can jeopardize or sabotage the entire team's success. Now, you, like the whole football team, if it parts of you, the beliefs inside of you are in alignment with no problem, you'll attract your wealth. But if part of you in belief that you doesn't support your intention, it will jeopardize or sabotage you. That's why you may have lousy luck at love, romance, money, or health. Now, some part of you doesn't want it, but we need to heal that part. And when you do, you are clear. And when you are clear, you are free to attract anything that you can imagine. Are you clear right now? How do you know if you're even clear right now? Think of something that you want to have, to do, or to be, and why don't you have it? If your answer is something negative, then you aren't clear. If you say anything except an honest, I know it's the way, I know it's on the way to me, then you probably aren't clear inside with what you want. 
Another question to ask yourself is, what does it mean that you don't yet have what you want? Your answer to the question will reveal your beliefs. For example, if you say, I have to do such and such first, then you have to believe for what you have to do something before you can even have what you want. If you say, my soul doesn't want me to have this, then you are stating your own beliefs about what you think your soul wants you for you. And if you say, I don't know how to get what I want, then you are revealing your belief that says that you have to know how to get what you want before you can have it. The truth is, nothing means anything in and of itself. You and I apply meanings to the events and call it the truth. But the meaning reveals of our beliefs, sometimes those beliefs serve us and sometimes they don't. So how to locate your beliefs? Your beliefs aren't that hard to find. First understand what a belief is according to Bruce D. Morsico, creator of the Option Method, a brilliant tool for exploring beliefs. A belief is assuming something to be true, to be a fact. A belief is not cause. It's not created by a choice. A belief about a thing exists is not the same as the existence. The other words, a shirt is not a belief. It's a fact. It's an existence. But saying a shirt is good for your personality, personally or not is a belief. Self-help author Mandy Evans, an option method practitioner, says, Certain beliefs can lead to very bad things. Beliefs can cause stress to your business or life situations. But if your perception of an event that causes on... Your, it's your perception of an event that causes how you feel. Now, there's what happens. There's what happens to you in life, and then there's what you decide it, it. And then there's what you decided that it meant. Mandy told me over lunch one day. She's the author of the Traveling Free: How to Recover from the Past by Changing Your Beliefs, Changing Your Conclusions, or Your Beliefs about the Events in Your Past. She explained, "You could change your way you live your life today. Certain beliefs can really trip us up. Beliefs can be." Shape the way that we feel, the way we think and act. Mandy says that she's an expert in personal belief systems, but you can often can't change those inner systems until you know what they are. She offers a list of top 10 self-defeating beliefs in Traveling Free. Her second book has a way to begin exploring them. As you look at each belief, as you, as you ask yourself, you believe it. As she suggests, if you do, then you ask yourself, you believe it. Gently, explore your own reasons for buying into any self-limiting belief. And here are 10 of the top 20 limiting beliefs. Number 1. I'm not good enough to be loved. No matter what I do, I should be doing something else. If it hasn't happened yet, it never will. If you know what I'm really like, then you wouldn't want me. I don't know what I want. I upset people. Sex is dirty and nasty. Save it for one you love. Better stop wanting. If you get your hopes up, you'll get hurt. If I fail, I should be bad for the long time and be really scared to try again. I should have worked this out by now. Those are all beliefs. Sometimes you need another person to point out your beliefs. But when my friend Linda and I had breakfast one day, I had hired her to help me in some promotion. She said, I'm afraid some of my friends will be jealous of me. That's a belief, I said. Linda's eyes widened and her face lit up. It is? She asked. It had never occurred to her that the fear was a belief, and belief she could let go of, and she needed another person to shine a light on that belief. Here's another example of what I mean. How to get a new car. The following happened many years ago, but I remember it well. I needed a car. Bad. The only thing driving was an old clunker, and it could only move as you pushed it. Okay, I wasn't that bad, but whenever the car broke down, I broke down. Paying to repair bills, it was killing me. And never knowing that the car could get where I was going was stressing me out. I needed it. I needed help. I called Jonathan because of the fear of my car salespeople from what I once knew of his tactics. I told Jonathan what I wanted. He said, well, what you really want is often under what you say you want. What you're having this new car do for you. Huh? Jonathan went to explain that what we want may be feeling rather than a product. Focus on feeling of what will happen or what will help me get what I really want. And what would I feel if I had a new car? What a mind stopper. I developed a brain squeezing headache just thinking about it. I got off the phone and my head began to throb as if I'd been hit with a sledgehammer. Although I almost never take medicine, I ate a handful of aspirin like popcorn and it didn't help. I went to see Jonathan in person, sitting in the presence of his accepted energy, letting my pain speak to me. I suddenly saw ache between my eyes and a huge black ball of tightly woven thread. Mentally, the thread would loosen and I'd hear a belief. You can't afford a new car. I let it go and another belief would unravel. What would you do if your dad say about the car? And then another one, thread of belief, would slide out. How will you afford it? And then another, and then another, and then another. As these beliefs slowly apart and left, the black ball of the pain got smaller and smaller. And within 20 minutes, the headache was completely gone. I was healed. I was clear. I was happy. Now get this. Although I didn't think that it was really possible, I followed my intuition immediately, went to the car dealership, felt and led the visit consciously. I knew that there was no way I can get a new car. I had never had a new car in my entire life. My credit was lousy, but I let go and I trusted. When I went to the car dealership, a gentleman there helped me look around and then I told him what I wanted. And he said that I had one car to fit the description. We walked out to the back and there would, there, it was right there. It was perfect. It was gold and beautiful and brand new. Does it have a cassette player? It looked and he nodded. Well, I said, let's do the hard part. Let's see if I can buy it. 